Okay, I don't know if I'll have uh, the willpower to come back to this if I don't start if I don't do the big game now. So, not that I dislike it. It's just it's going to be really tough to relearn everything if I put it aside, even for a game. I've had a hard enough time holding on to the rules as I've gone. All right, so we're going to do the big game, and the biggest thing in the big game is that we add the concept of diplomacy to the game. There, now the concept itself is pretty simple, but all the specifics are painful. Um, right, we'll be using whatever the full sequence of play is, which damned if I know uh, where it is. Okay, so the only thing that's added is this alliance phase, and anything that's subject to random movement, which we'll see, there are going to be some things. We're also going to be adding, in addition to that, there's uh, uh, random events, which I'll probably have to look up in a, in a bit because I've been kind of looking at the alliance phase. So, the core of the alliance phase is diplomacy. Um, basically, like in, uh, I haven't, I don't think I've covered a game like this. Uh, you essentially just get a, uh, a set of points for diplomacy per turn. And that's going to be uh, set in the uh, rules for the particular scenario. I think it's like 10 in this, but God knows. Um, yeah, you get like 20 diplomacy points at the beginning of the game. No, 50 at the beginning of the game. And then uh, 25 in each additional turn. Okay, so on the first turn you have more. And you secretly allocate these to various major independents, which are listed here. Now there's going to be a bunch of minor independents as well, and basically every, every little symbol on the map means something here. <laughs> uh, you know, so like this green dragon, that's a place where you can go and send an emissary. But something like the Black Horse Country, well, that's the home of Ethelris and his Black Horse troop, which you'll be able to ally. Now, in order to get an alliance with someone, you have to throw points in uh, at least equal to this amount. And then you can declare, I think I've got enough points to ally. And you declare how many points you've got in that set, in, in that uh, uh, nation. And then your opponent tells you, nope, you don't have enough over me to do it. Or, yep, you got him. Or perhaps I have enough over you that I get him, I guess. I'm not sure. I don't think that's actually a possibility. Um, if you fail, there's a penalty. Um, the person who's inactive gets five additional points in that uh, uh, alliance, in, 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 towards that alliance. So he's already ahead of you, and now he's just gotten a bonus because of your inept attempt to ally with something without laying the groundwork. However, there are other factors here. So, for example, if you go walking through uh, neutral independent, each unit that spends any time in a movement phase, not leaving the area, but entering the area or sitting there for the entire turn, is going to cost you one diplomatic point in that area. Um, actually assigned to the other player, but the net is probably essentially the right, the same. Um, now the one thing I'm not sure about here, let's take a look again at the scenario rolls. Because uh, I think you start with a pile of points. Like I said, the 50 points. I think you start with those, and then I'm not sure when you get the five extra points. There's a diplomacy segment of the first game turn. Ah, I got you. Okay, so we're going to have, so we've got a bigger uh, set of rules here. 
uh, of sequence of play. So first we have a diplomacy segment where we both go. And I don't know how you decide who uh, makes their declaration first. Uh, then there's going to be a random events where you essentially just will be rolling on this random events table here and reading a result. And that's, uh, I think, an 11 to 66 table. Hey, this is a fairly early game to have that. I don't know who invented them. <laughs> I, uh, at one point, thought that it was uh, possibly fighting sale, but this should predate it, at least the original Chaosium version. This one's a little bit more recent, I think, from the 80s. So maybe they switched the, the methodology from... Uh, white bear, red moon, or whatever. Um, okay. And then this deals with the victory points and such. Not great. So now... That's the normal kind of diplomacy uh, against with the majors. For minors, what you use is... Hand hurts for some unknown, or my wrist. You use this emissary table. Basically, if you send a piece, and it has to be either a lunar imperial piece or a sartorite piece, uh, to one of these non uh, major places, you generally will roll a die on here. And on a four, five, or six, you get the alliance. On a one or a two, on a three, you don't. On a one or a two, you not only uh, don't get the alliance, but any units that you sent as an emissary are killed. <laughs> and uh, herds and treasures will also be eliminated at that point. Now, when you gain an alliance of any type, any folks that are hanging out there who shouldn't be there are, are murdered but their treasures and herds are captured instead, which is a little bit more severe, I guess. Okay. Well, what about these different groups? Unfortunately, they're not arranged in the best of formats in the rule book. No big surprise there. So, I'm going to go over a few of these very briefly. Uh, Crag Spider. Crag Spider is one of the majors. Um, she counts as a hero. Uh, has control of the Pillar of Fire, which is a three-hex area. Uh, and it'll destroy all units in those areas, including herds and treasures. Dragons and superheroes are able to save themselves and others, uh, as with these other major destruction spells. Crag Spider's spirit will die if she uses this. And it's like the others which have to have it. Now, when she joins the side, she also brings dark trolls in with her. No big shock there. Um, those are just going to be three dark trolls and some trollkin. I don't think they're magic users, but we can look. And also a dragon. Well, we haven't talked about dragons. Okay, we'll talk about them later. But she brings the black dragon in. And now we have to find where Crag Spider is to understand everything, right? Crag Spider's mountain and cliff home. And then there's going to be a... Here's the Black Dragon. Here's Cliff Home. This must be Crag Spider's Mountain, this whole setup there. Okay. <sighs> Delecti. Now this... Here we go to a minor alliance. Delecti is a necromancer. In order to ally with him, you have to send an emissary. However, it's an automatic alliance. But he will kill the necromancer and create... Uh, or, or the uh, emissary, and he'll create the first of his zombies. Now, this is zombie number two, I think. Yeah. No, this is zombie number seven, the number here. That's, of course, his uh, combat writing. Okay. Well, what's up with zombies? Hmm. Zombies are kind of screwy. Um, <sighs> you create a zombie when you ally with Delecti. All other zombies are created during combat. Whenever um, a major unit other than a dragon, giant, or zombie is eliminated while adjacent to Delecti or another zombie, a new zombie is created. The new zombie must be numbered one higher than the last zombie in the chain, and it is placed adjacent to the last zombie in the chain. If there are no zombies already on the board, the new one must be one and has to stack with Delecti. New zombies cannot be placed in lake, sea, or river hexes. Zombies cannot go adjacent to the enemy unless they're stacked with units of the side allied with Delecti. 
Uh, if there are no hexes in which they can be placed, no new zombie is created. There's a limit by countermix. Delecti has to keep his army, um, he has to stack with a zombie in order to be in connection with his chain of zombies. And he's in contact with any in which he's stacked and any which are connected by a path of hexes containing at least one zombie. Yay, they can actually stack. So he's got to keep them as kind of a horde on the board. <laughs> Which can, of course, be a problem with the earth, with the earth shakers and such not, who are particularly good at cleaning up zombies. They pay one movement point to enter any hex and none to leave or cross a hex side. They cannot enter lake, sea, or river, but they can enter ford or headwaters. Headwaters, of course, are uh, where the rivers start. Interesting combination. A ford would be where a road or something crosses it. Ah, oh. zombies have to move as a chain. <laughs> So basically, they have to maintain their uh, Now here it makes it sound like they cannot stack The first zombie to be moved must either be the first zombie in the chain of zombies or the last the next zombie must uh, be moved first stopping uh, Following the same path stopping one hex short of it each successive zombie in the chain must follow the path. So, that sounds like they can't actually stack, except for Delecti can stack with one. When zombies defend against spirit magic, they rely on Delecti's magical strength to defend them. Well, how good is he? And you can see, you know, there's just page after page of these. So he's got a 10 magical strength, which he can defend them with. Um. If the magical loss suffered by the side controlling Delecti equals or exceeds Delecti's magic factor, all of the zombies involved in the battle can be eliminated. However, if the zombies are eliminated, Delecti's magic factor is counted towards fulfilling the magical factor loss of the side that controlled the zombies, even if Delecti's not involved. Okay, so if you take the 10 hit points, um, it counts. It can wipe out all the zombies. Each zombie has a combat factor of two when any zombies fight in melee. Uh, the combat factor total of all zombies on the board is added to the total uh, to the side that controls the zombies. So it's not a big deal that they're spread out because the more of them are on the board, the more powerful each single one is. So that's kind of cool. They're not affected by terrain for their combat factor. They cannot charge or retreat. If they're disrupted, they're eliminated. And that's why they just say zombie on the back. All right. Well, I'm gonna do this in pulses because this is gonna be put together probably with some play or at least something. And I'll get to the dinosaurs in a bit. I don't wanna go through the whole rules all at once. We okay, let's keep plugging our way through here. The next of the minor ally type things are the dinosaurs. Now they work a little differently from everything else. But they're basically strength point markers. They're going to be randomly placed on all the dinosaur spaces on the board. Now, there's an explanation of why there are dinosaurs. They're essentially uh, dragon relatives. It all sort of fits in. There's a certain silliness element to a lot of Glorantha, and this is part of it, but that's okay. Um, in a sense, there's also this tremendous working to make the silliness factor actually make sense in the game, and that's part of what's described here. Um, okay. If dinosaurs are used in the scenario, and they will be here, um, they're set up before everything else, and they don't follow normal uh, alliance rules, basically they'll join anything that stacks with them. However, they have bad memories, so they won't stay with you. Uh, if they're left alone at any time except movement phase, they forget that they're with you and are available to the other player. So they become kind of an interesting thing to gather and use in fights. Uh, okay, Dragon Newts. Dragon Newts are actually my favorite race in Glorantha. Uh, a little bit of background on them. <sighs> they're immortal. Uh, you, if Dragon Newts die, in Glorantha, they're reborn, hatched uh, in their cities. And their cities are these uh, things, and they're going to be numbered and spread out throughout the map 
in oops in various places this is their capital space right there in the dragon's eye and these cities shift around and all kind of cool stuff but you ally them uh, by normal um, uh, major power rules and if they're eliminated in a turn they'll come back in the rally phase in a home in the home city for that uh, um, dragon if the home city has been occupied by enemy units at any time during the entire game well at any time since dragon Roots have entered the game basically the assumption is their city has fallen and their nest is destroyed so they won't be able to uh, by the enemy um, they won't be able to show up again the inhuman king can appear anywhere in the dragon's eye uh, if the Inhuman King himself is eliminated and fails a heroic escape, then uh, he'll show back at the Eye. If he can't be resurrected, though, if the entire Dragon's Eye has been captured, um, Dragon Roots will not resurrect for the rest of the game. Dragon Roots also have these roads, which are indicated by these symbols, which have on them a direction. So this one heads to here, heads to here, etc. This is important because they have sort of a, a neat movement capability with that. Now, there are also junctions. Um, looking, there's a junction uh, where multiple road paths cross. And that uh, is to indicate that. Now, the way their roads work is a Dragon Newt, um, only Dragon Newts can use them. And they have to be in or move to a Dragon Root City or the Shaker's Temple in order to begin moving on a Dragon Root Road. At that point, at a cost of one movement point, um, they can travel down the entire road. They can either stop at a junction, um, an enemy zone of control, or a hex adjacent to an enemy unit that's not, that is on the road. Uh, uh, an enemy zone of control on the road makes it so that they can't continue traveling along that road. They have to stop at that point and then perhaps fight. But if there's no zone of control, uh, they can just travel uh, for free down the road until they hit basically a city or a Shaker's Temple, wherever that is. There it is. That's on the path of their roads. Okay. What about dragons themselves? Well, dragons themselves have these dragon rests, which is where you're gonna go to uh, summon them, and you use the emissary table for that, except for the black dragon. Um, the black dragon is not allowed to leave Crag Spire, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Crag Spider's territory which I think is just the mountains, but I'm not positive of that. Um, what about the others? I think the others are able to move and attack uh, normally. Um, okay, an attack by a dragon is a dragon fight. Dragon fights take place during exotic magic. If an active dragon is adjacent to an inactive an enemy unit, uh, it must dragon fight in the phase unless every unit adjacent to it is eliminated by other means before the end of the exotic magic phase. Every enemy unit adjacent to a dragon and the dragon itself will be eliminated when a dragon fight takes place. Even herds and treasures will be eliminated. However, if there's a dragon among the enemy units, the two dragons are eliminated but nothing else. Heroes and superheroes eliminated in dragon fights can attempt heroic escapes. And a superhero may be able to save other units stacked with it. If one of the stacks is within one hex of a dragon fight contains superheroes, the active player must decide between eliminating one of the superheroes and eliminating all of the units in the stack other than the superhero. So he can spend his own life to save all the units there. Uh, how that interacts with his escape ability, I got no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, 
I, I really have no idea. I think the elimination of the superhero to a dragon has a chance of escaping still. I'm just not sure. Dragons in physical combat. Uh, okay, so the combat factor for a dragon is equal to the total printed combat factors of the unit stacked with it. Well, what the hell does that matter? Uh, a dragon that's not stacked with a unit has a numeric, uh, has a combat factor of zero. If dragons are stacked together, their combat factor is equal to the combat factor total of all the other units in the stack divided by the number of dragons, so they'll add up to the full strength. Their combat is not affected by terrain. So what? Why would they get uh, a physical combat factor? I have no idea. <laughs> because they should have to dragon fight. So I don't know why that rule is even in here. Um, dragons are immune to all forms of magic, including exotic. Any spirits that use chaotic magic or spirit magic in a battle in which the opponent seeing units include a dragon are eliminated without having any effect on any of the units. If a stack of units includes a dragon, that stack suffers no losses due to chaotic magic, physical magic, or spirit magic. Dragons can save up to three units stacked with them now, from any effects of the exotic magic. Okay, exotic magic is a little stronger than the others against them. The player who controls the dragon decides which units to be saved. A dragon can neutralize uh, the glow line or the glow spot, and or the glow spot. Um, so they're a little stronger than the other uh, thing that neutralizes the glow spot, uh, the glow line, which is Prince Argrath, who cannot affect the glow spot. Okay, what about the dwarf? Well, the dwarf has his own little special table here. When you go to talk to the dwarf, um, you roll a die on his table instead of the normal emissary table. And you may get one of his special items, or he may join you. Um, now, if he joins you, you don't get any of his gifts normally. Although there's a scenario where that is. His particular gifts, well, geez, I don't know what they all do. <laughs> They're not all spelled out here, unfortunately. Oh, here, here they talk about them. You've got like this cannon, an alchemical uh, transformer, and the stone man. The cannon is kind of like a magic user in that it has a spirit, the cannon cult or whatever, that can uses a physical attack on people. Artillery sounds a lot like physical uh, spirits anyway, so that makes sense. But the alchemical transformer can double the magic factor or range factor of any one unit that stacks with it. If a spirit magician's magic factor is doubled, the magic factor of the spirit is also doubled. If a physical magic factor, uh, magician's magic factor is doubled, the combat factor of his agent is doubled. If a chaotic unit's magic factor is doubled, it can devour twice as many units uh, as normal, but you can't double its range factor. And since I'm doing breaks, I'm gonna push this here. We've already actually had the exiles in play, and we know what they do from the last one. We've had the pony breeders in play. We know what they do. So let's jump down to Hungry Jack. Hungry Jack is weird. Yes, he's a giant jack-o'-lantern. Let's keep going with the compendium, and we may just have a special intro video for this scenario oh, or for the full rules. Okay, Hungry Jack. Hungry Jack's a big giant jack-o'-lantern. If you want to ally with him, you just have to grab him and bring him onto the board. He's not on the board at the beginning of the game. He can only be brought in by a dragon. The dragon has to fly off the west. I'm always bad with my directions. North is that way. It doesn't read news, so west is that way. So you're gonna fly off the west side of the board. Um, stay off the map for two full game turns, and then you can bring Hungry Jack back in. Okay, so what's so special about Hungry Jack that you'd wanna bring him in? There's a story about him in uh, oh, one of the Worms footnotes or something like that. I, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Uh, the magazine that I have actually I think I have a republication of some of the best issues um, bound okay he's got the ability to pull other units to himself at the start of enemy movement 
uh, Hungry Jack can announce that one of the active units is to be drawn to it. The other players must give the player who controls him a reasonable opportunity to make such an announcement. Um, you can pick a unit out of a stack if screening is used, but you don't get to know what the unit is. You can say, I want the third one from the bottom. You can't just call out, I want Jar Eel! <laughs> or something like that. You have to pick a unit that you can see or guess at. Um, and then that unit must continue moving uh, until stopped by the normal movement rules. How this might conflict with Berserker, um, I would say Hungry Jack probably takes precedence because he's really kind of taking over your mind here. Um, although it is... I don't know. You seem like you're sort of under your own will in part while you're being controlled by him, I guess. Um, all right. Jack can be aided by up to two magicians. The magician must be stacked with him to help him, and they cannot provide magical support or make a magical attack of any form in the game turn they aid Jack. Each of these units can cause an additional unit to come towards Jack. Jack also has stats... But they're not terribly valuable. He's very easy to turn into pie. Um, so, you know, the, the main goal for this is he's something that can pull off something like a superhero or something uh, that's very powerful with a bat. Um, but until you find the right unit, it could be difficult to get it. Okay, what about the Hydra? Hydra is not too exciting. It's on Hydra's Hill. And here, here's the problem. I'm going to have to find all these locations because uh, they don't give a hex number on any of them, which was really kind of a, a dumb thing. So, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I want the Hydra or whatever, now you have to look all over the map to try to find where this may be. Uh, the traveling stones up here, that's one of them. I'm looking around the edges because that seems more likely. But I'm not seeing it. Um, anyhow, the Hydra may not be worth it uh, to look for. E in order to uh, make a deal with the Hydra, you have to feed it a number of units equal to its uh, magic factor. Now... I think when you find it, you determine its magic factor. There's something that works that way. Yeah, here's the Hydra. So uh, it'll have a magic factor of N, which is like a die roll. I don't know what that dash before it is. It may be chaotic, and therefore that's a negative N. So you have to feed it a number of units, and uh, then it'll be your buddy. Uh, we've already talked about Iron Hoof. I forgot about his ability, and that's the real problem with a game where everything's special abilities, right? <sighs> yeah. It may be cool, it may be not cool, but it means that, you know, you almost have to study the game and play it a lot uh, to know how to use all your units together. Otherwise, you forget to use their abilities entirely. Okay, anyway. Um... Oh, and here they talk about what is mounted. Uh, okay, the Puppeteer Troop. Uh, these are a bunch of jugglers and acrobats. Now, this is a whole pile of counters. And what's done is each one is set up somewhere. I don't remember where. Um, set of locations that you find at the beginning of the game. And you flip them over. And so this one's an illusionary army. One of them's not illusionary. Somewhere. There we go. Uh, if you flip over and find the uh, wrong one, um, it gets discard well, it gets put aside because they can be used, they can be used later. Uh, but if you find the right one, then you can uh, go with the normal emissary process, rolling a die to see what you get. All right. So if you get them on your side, 
Uh, you can make them create illusionary armies in your exotic magic phase. Um, and once they join the side, well, once the correct location is found, you can take all the illusionary armies off the map, and then they're put aside to be used if somebody gets control of them. Um, so what's cool about these illusionary armies is that the puppeteers can trade places with them during play. Uh, it doesn't really say when, at least not there. Um, if an illusionary army is disrupted, it's destroyed. It's removed from the board, but can be created. If it's eliminated, it's removed from the board and cannot be replaced. Um, whenever the puppeteers are in battle, they can trade with an illusionary army to avoid the effects of combat. I think they can also trade into them um, to get into a combat, but I'm not sure. If an illusionary army is adjacent to an enemy dragon or superhero, the illusionary army is destroyed. Screening is used, the location of the dragon or superhero must be uh, revealed in order for it to eliminate, eliminate an illusionary army. The illusionary army doesn't have to be revealed. Uh, it's up to the player to know what happens. And we'll take another break in these. this compendium. Okay, let's keep working our way through here. <coughs> uh, Sir Ethelred, Ethelrist and the Black Horse Troop over here, the other ones who killed Hungry Jack and made pie out of him. Um, okay, what's interesting about him is you're gonna have, or his faction, first of all, he's considered a major faction with a territory and everything, but he's got a bunch of neat little items. So he's got this Cloak of Darkness uh, that is always with him. He can use it during exotic magic after uh, an alliance. He places the cloak in a hex occupied by Ethelrist. Um, and for two complete game turns after the cloak's been placed on the board, it sends out an enveloping cloud of non-light that encompasses all hexes within ten of it. Uh, the cloak may not be moved. The counter is ignored for all purposes uh, while in cloud form. Units must stop upon entering a hex within the cloud, however. Uh, Ethelrest the Hound, the Black Horse unit, Spirits, Dragons, superheroes, and units stacked with dragons and or superheroes are exempted from uh, the restriction. Illusionary armies will be removed from the board, but then they can be recreated. Um, I would assume that's only ones can, under player control, because it wouldn't make a lot of sense to remove, to try to look, hey, is this illusionary, is this illusionary, <laughs> right? Uh, that would be a cheat. I could you know, would show potentially where the uh, the jugglers are. Okay, he's also got a dog. Um, he can ride the dog, in fact he must, and when riding it his movement factors 10, uh, but he can't use heroic movement. Uh, the player who controls him can unleash the hound on a doom run. And basically the hound moves in a straight line from the hex it occupies to the edge of the map. Uh, and the player chooses the row of hexes in which he'll travel. The hound eliminates every unit in its path. Once the hound reaches the map board edge, it itself is eliminated. Dragons and superheroes can stop the hound and save any units stacked with them. When the hound enters a hex that contains a dragon or superhero, the hound itself is eliminated. If it was stopped by a superhero, the superhero is eliminated as well, but he might escape. If Sir Athelrest is eliminated in a battle or through exotic magic, and the Hound survives, the Hound m makes the Doom run immediately in a random direction. Okay, Keener Than. Keener Than is a former ally of Athelrest's who turns against him. He's allowed to also control the Hound. By the way, Keener Than, I believe, goes... Let's see if it's somewhere. Um, yeah, here. So the enemy immediately gets Keener Than as soon as someone uh, takes Ethelrest as an ally. Um, if the Hound passes within three hexes of Keener Than while on a Doom Run, he, it immediately stops the Doom Run and moves to the hex Keener Than is in. Keener Than then gets control of the Hound. In the next exotic magic phase, he must release the Hound on a Doom Run um, and for that one turn or whatever that he's 
got it. He must ride the hound as well. Uh, there's a spirit of movement. Um, this is going to be at the Traveling Stone, which I pointed out up here. I've no, I just don't know where the Hydra is. Uh, <coughs> um, and it's allied by the normal emissary rules uh, for the minor powers. Um, has a movement factor of two when it's alone. When a stack of units spends an entire movement phase stacked with the spirit, the movement factor of, of all units in the stack are doubled. The spirit's magic factor is equal to the largest of those um, movement factor is equal to the largest of those doubled movement factors. Um, the spirit also doubles the movement of any units stacked with it when it retreats. Hmm. Maybe I've been doing retreats wrong. I thought you just retreat a hex. Looks like I've forgotten in there, or I've missed that. Uh, the player who uses the who controls the spirit can uh, use its power to double the movement factor of all his units. In one movement phase, after allying with the spirit, he can remove the spirit from play, and then everything he has is doubled for one movement phase. That can be a pretty potent way to uh, blitz your way around something. The Sundown Templars. Um, the Yamalio uh, worshippers. Uh, they reside in Sundown Temple. Oh, there it is. They can be approached by emissaries. They double their combat factor when they're defending in a melee. This doubling uh, applies to both taking losses and uh, the casualties. And that's because they're well-armed phalanx units that <coughs> presumably should work better in defense. I'm not sure I buy that. I would think that a phalanx works pretty well in offense too, but uh, the Tusk Riders. <laughs> They normally reside at the Ivory Plinth, which has to be somewhere near Prax, if I recall correctly. But there's Chaldon's Rest. Ah, uh, I don't know. Oh no, this is Apple Lane. I don't remember where the Ivory Plinth is. <sighs> Here's where the dwarf lives, by the way. Um, oh, it's way up here in Chaos Land, basically. Snake Pie Polo is a really nasty Chaos place. There was a scenario. Uh, I wish I had gotten it, but there was a whole campaign scenario pack for that. Um, what's special about them? Any? Uh, you can't use the normal emissary method on them. You have to do blood sacrifices. Any magic, any magician can sacrifice another unit other than a disembodied or spirit or treasure at the plinth. Heroes and superheroes cannot attempt a hero escape. Uh, the magicians and the units must be at the plinth in the alliance phase. Uh, on the sacrifice, the sacrificed unit is eliminated and the die is rolled on a two through five and alliance is granted. On a one, the alliance is rejected and the magician is eliminated. We have giants. Giants will come up on the random events table. And there's some other things like the twin stars uh, that aren't then covered in the compendium. They're only here. I don't know. Uh, in random movement phase, the giants move randomly on the board. They move like normal units when they're moving. Every player's units are considered inactive units uh, with zones of control. If they end their movement adjacent to player's units, they attack those units as though it's normal movement. So, um, And if there are giants on the board, you have to treat them as an enemy unit. And we've already dealt with the assassins. That's all that's there. Now, there's more to these rules that I haven't covered yet that I cannot for the life of me remember right at this moment. So I'm going to pause again and I'll come back at some point to finish them up. As you can tell, I really hate doing compendium-like things, um, you know, Hey, when we did, uh, if you watch Dragon Hunt, all the little mystical critters, they said, well, we'll look at them when they come out. 
Unfortunately, in this game, they're all available. They all have to be known. It's like, you know, studying the pieces in uh, Third Reich or Advanced Third Reich to see which countries you might want to try to get alliances with, etc. And actually, I'd say the alliance system is kind of similar to something like A3R or uh, I think WIF had a similar one too, where you throw points into something and you hope to get an advantage. There, there is a die roll type situation. Here, it's just. Uh, it's purely uh, deterministic. You know, I got enough more points than you that I'm going to get the bonus. Well, great. Um, that's not going to be a lot of fun to solo, but <laughs> I'll, you know, I fake it as much as I can. I'll plot what the, the points are, but it's a <clears throat> an annoying type of situation to actually solo. And I would rather see something more interesting um a a anything where you're you're secretly bidding or anything on something it just doesn't work as well so long i tend to avoid games that that's all you do but well there's a lot more going on here obviously so it's not too bad to have to do that every turn again the rules normally have seemed pretty good but i've run into one here with the puppeteers that's really kind of painful so at the start of the game in which the puppeteers are available, the five illusionary armies are placed in the following locations, and it lists five areas. Unfortunately, there's six counters. Five of them are illusionary armies, one's not. <sighs> then after you place the five illusionary armies there, the puppeteers and four blank counters are placed in a cup. What? <laughs> My feeling is one of the illusionary armies isn't placed. I'm also trying to figure out and the reason that I ran into that at all, movement. They don't move normally. Um, they can trade places, but then they can move normally. What? <laughs> I mean, Jesus. They don't have a movement allowance on them. Um... <laughs> I have no idea how these are intended to work. And this, unfortunately... Okay, once they're reduced, they have a movement allowance. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This guy has a movement allowance. Okay. So, I don't know. One of these probably says it's not an illusionary army or something. That's all I can guess. Do I want to look at them all and reshuffle? Uh, yeah, I think I have to. Let's redo this. Okay, illusionary armies. Illusionary armies. I'm in the business of right now... No, there's nothing to distinguish the five illusionary armies from each other. However, the one that's not an illusionary army is quite obviously not an illusionary army. Maybe on the back now it's going to say, ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. So here's what I think happens. The illusionary armies... There are blank counters here that they're talking about. Um, unfortunately, I have them not clipped, and I have my illusionary army clipped, which means that the illusionary armies will go where they are on the board. Only the regular army can move normally. It does sort of make sense if you puzzle it out. Um... Why is, it's a pain that this isn't in troll rune, I wonder if that's uh, where the Tuskers start. Oh, jeez, there's another one somewhere. I'm going to have to hunt them all down again. This is irritating. Oh, no. Too Far is apparently a town, not a stockade. I don't know. Um... Okay, so apparently what happens is basically each time you find one of these, there's a one in five chance 
or whatever, that it is the correct one. Um, there's no marking on the counter to help you find the correct ones. So there's just going to be a random chance. Uh, and that decreases as the counters get used up. Okay. So now, um, as to the movement, it seems like only the regular one can move and any illusionary armies cannot. And you can leave illusionary armies where the base army has already been. Okay. So that's that. What I'm doing is I'm setting up the minor uh, uh, independence on the board so that I know places of interest that I want to go. I thought about setting up the majors on the board as well, but basically what you'd have is just this tremendous stack in a key location. Now, for example, in the Grayslands, I don't know where I got to go to find them, so I'd have to look that up, which is a reason maybe I want to put... Oh no, I don't have to go anywhere because these get done with the without emissaries. They get done through the uh, uh, diplomatic points methodology. So I don't actually have to visit those areas. No big deal there. The negative to not having them on the board is I can't kind of see the pile of pieces that they'd have, but they'll be in the counter trays and it'll keep, uh, it'll keep the level of counters uh, a little less. Um, the congestion. Uh, most of them I've put upside down, except for the dinosaurs, which I'm leaving face uh, forward because really the dinosaurs work like that all the time. Three of the dinosaurs in the game are magicians and have their own little spirits. <laughs> They're all kind of near each other. And I'll continue my setup here, but I need a break from this. So this is the setup of the neutrals for this scenario. Obviously, I'm not going to get into any play before I load this video up. Um, well, of the independents that are not major independents. Uh, I finished that up, had some trouble finding the ivory plinth, but nothing too exciting here. Uh, and now... This scenario doesn't define which side's the attacker, the aggressor. That's going to be determined randomly. Odd, I'm going to make that the Lunars. Okay, so Sartor is going to be on the initial aggressive position, which means they get to select the Lunar timetable and they must set up first. Um, <coughs> there's only 14 turns to the scenario. And let's see. We're going to have, what here? Okay, for setup, Sartor can set up all their pieces within all of Sartor, or they can detach up to 10 units for the South Soldier Reserve, which essentially can enter down here instead. Uh, there might be some advantages to that in particular in terms of uh, gaining control uh, if there are any if there are any independents down there um, the victory condition uh, you know for example we've got these we got the dragon down here I could send troops down to go get to the dragon um, I'm not dragons appear to be very powerful uh, and they should be in Rengu's terms so it might be worth trying to seize the most dragons possible that might be a, a, a good task basically this one's close to the Lunars. Um, there should be another one close to the Sartorites. Yeah, way down here. And then this one becomes somewhat, you know, difficult for either side to get. But Sartor could put uh, some forces to go get that pretty quickly. I don't see anything else that's really terribly of interest in that direction except hey you know if I can get a jump over here maybe I can even get this although I would think the Lunars are gonna grab that one pretty quickly. Uh, the Black Dragon is associated only with Cragspire so, or Crag Spider, so you're not gonna um, have a second conflict to go get that. That's gonna be done through diplomacy. <clears throat> um, and let's see, the victory conditions in this one are uh, 
controlling opposing fortresses with the edge going to the person who's on the defense, i.e. the person who didn't get to pick the lunar timetable. It'll go 14 turns. Now, the big game uh, is a 28 turn game where the goal is to take either bald home or uh, furthest. I think I mentioned this in the diplomacy segment, but if I didn't, I have to point it out now. If you take one of those, the other guy doesn't get diplomacy points as long as you're sitting on it. So there's a very, very good reason to win in terms of grabbing that and to protect that. I think that is about it. Uh, oh, this is for the three-player scenario. Oh. Here's something we forgot. I knew there was something I didn't talk about yet. Replacements. Both uh, the Sartre and the Lunars get replacements. For every uh, two infantry units they lose, it goes into a dead pile. And uh, during the replacement uh, phase, which I believe is the rallying point, um, they can pull an infantry out and put it on the board and destroy another one. Now, I believe they have to be uh, based on the combat factors. So basically, you have to uh, destroy permanently one with a higher combat factor. You're also allowed to do this with cavalry. Um, however, for those, it takes two permanently lost units to get a re uh, unit back on the board. And where do these go? Uh, bold home or furthest and I don't think you get mages back Now I'm probably not going to do the long scenario the marathon game here that has a further replacement value um, Where you're allowed to spend replace you're allowed to spend dip points in order to buy back units that are even permanently destroyed um, Cavil cost double their combat factor and dip points. And again, it doesn't... It looks like you're only allowed to take infantry and cavalry. Well, I'm assuming that means you can't recreate mages, even if they happen to be mounted. They're not cavalry particularly then. It doesn't strike me that it's terribly well described there, but mages, for example, can't be helped by herds. Um, I should probably just load this up You'll see the setup, the final setup, when I when I actually start uh, the play. I don't see any reason to hold off that long.